Okay, my talk, topic for the today is uh, MRI of the shoulder, improving workflow. Uh, my time allotted is around 15 minutes. I might overstep a little bit. Uh, basically, in a workflow for an MRI of the shoulder, the way you can divide it is into three sections. The initial point is uh, with the patient interaction. When the patient enters, you take the history. Uh, you pick a protocol. Uh, we're going to talk about that. What is this particular protocol which you're going to use for that patient based on the history? You, it then goes to the tech who uses a certain protocol which is already fed into the machine, uh, decides whether the images are good or not, depending on whether the patient is uncooperative or if it's a post-op patient, then forwards it on to the radiologist who looks at it, decides whether it's fine or not, whether any alternative needs to be done, then goes in for the reporting checklist and finally comes up with the report. Uh, the ways to improve it is, of course, that you, you uh, prepare the patient before the examination, check that everything is ready, check the coil is ready. Uh, you go in for the localizer, choose the protocol. You, there's actual scan time. You try to reduce it by reducing the number of slices so that exactly the amount of the anatomy is picked in. You use iPad. You, finally, in your uh, reporting, you look at your checklist. You look at alternative diagnosis and you try to find out what is the exact cause of the patient's symptoms. How do you decide the preset protocol? We generally have uh, three or four protocols in our uh, center. The first is something like a cuff tear protocol in which the patient comes in with shoulder pain or restricted mobility. Then you have an instability protocol in those patients who have uh, recurrent dislocation and finally that in post-op patients. The imaging planes as you all know have to be in the plane of the supraspinatus tendon and not the muscle. If you do it along the muscle, you're not going to get the tendon uh, properly in plane. The other imaging planes include those for uh, the acromioclavicular joint. If the patient comes in specifically for acromioclavicular arthropathy, you basically need to do it perpendicular and parallel to the AC joint. Uh, studies have shown that if you take a section from the coracoid process to the bicipital groove, you'll get a very good uh, image which will look like that. You'll get perpendicular sections. Uh, to the AC joint. The traditional supraspinatus plane is what is shown by this white line. Here you'll get oblique views and you won't be able to determine too well what's exactly happening with the AC joint. And uh, similarly, if you have a query regarding the biceps or after doing the protocol you want to uh, evaluate the biceps in one go, you need to go to the topmost section and start from the biceps labral insertion and uh, take an oblique and in such a situation, you will get the entire biceps tendon in one plane. This also shows the biceps labral anchor very well. The standard protocol followed in our institution are actual FSPD images, coronal FSPD and T2, sagittal FSPD and T1. We try to keep the TR values of the uh, FSPD at 3000 and the TE values at 30. That works good for 1.5 Tesla so that you get very good quality images for uh, all tissues including ligaments and tendons. You use the smallest field of view of about 120 centimeters, highest matrix. We, we use 320 by 320. Going higher than that gives us more grainy images. We try to use uh, 3 mm slices at 0 to 10 percent gap and try to limit the imaging time to over 24 minutes. With an instability uh, with sufficient joint fluid, we just add on probably an axial medic and if necessary add on an actual T1 weighted images. If there's insufficient uh, joint fluid or if there's an ambiguous plane study, you go in for a MR arthro. Here again, you try to use 320 to 448 uh, mm, uh, matrix, 3 mm with zero interslice gap, and 15 to 17 minute protocol. You can add on a 10 minute uh, for an ABR, that is abduction and external rotation. That includes the coil positioning also. Finally, when you have a post-op patient, you have metal artifacts. To reduce it, you try to avoid using fat saturation. Uh, this is the kind of images you'll get with fat saturation. Uh, if you use a PD image without fat saturation, you'll be able to see the anchor very well. You'll be able to have a limitation. I mean, uh, you can reduce the uh, susceptibility artifacts by using high bandwidth, high matrix, and thin slices. You can also use arthrography in cases of post-operative cases to try to delineate anatomy. Like in this case, uh, you can just see a thin cuff. You can't make out whether there's anything going on. There does seem to be an articular surface partial tear, but when you do the arthrogram, you can make out that uh, there's an interstitial tear with contrast going into the tear. In an uncooperative patient, 
uh, which is pretty common with pain, uh, routine images will show quite a lot of artifacts. The ways out are either you use shorter scan by reducing the number of slices and reducing the, uh, the time by iPad. You use alternative sequences like actual medics uh, with iPad. And finally, you can use blade. Uh, we've used blade T2s, T1s, and FATSAT T2s. They do help only in those cases in which we just want to show that there is a complete rotator cuff tear and we don't want to go in for very good uh, labral pathology or very fine pathology which we uh, to see on a routine basis. A reporting workflow, we follow a checklist. Our basic checklist is that we look at first the AC joint and CA arch, second the cuff, and third intraarticular pathology. In cases of instability, we reverse that and we first look for hill sacs and bank arch lesions. Then we look for the cuff and then we look for the CA arch. In short, this, the, our uh, detailed checklist is something like this, a uh, very long list in which CA arch, we look at the acromion, whether there's a downslope, CA ligament and spur or ridge. We look at the AC joint and subacromial subdeltoid bursa. The cuff, we look at all tendons, we look at the biceps pulley, we look at the rotator interval. The glenohumeral joint, we look at alignment, cartilage, labrum, the biceps labral complex, and uh, glenohumeral ligaments. So just some uh, ways of showing this to you. So in a first run through, the first image that we look at is the coronal FSPD images. First you look at the AC joint. You can make out that there's chondral erosion with subchondral cystic changes. This can be a cause of pain. We look at the cuff. You can see that there's uh, a full thickness tear with retraction of the cuff and communication of uh, glenohumeral joint with the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Then we look at the inferior labrocapsular ligamentous complex to try to see whether there's any abnormality within it. Like in this case, we look at the AC joint, looks fine. Look at the cuff, looks fine. We see over here, instead of a usual U-shape of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, there's a J-like shape. That's a humeral avulsion of the uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament, or a Hagel lesion. In the secondary review, after the initial first run through, we start off with the SAG. We try to look at uh, the type of the acromion. We evaluate it fi either five slices lateral to the coracoid, just distal to the AC joint, or at the attachment of the CA ligament. We already know this, type 1 is sloping, type 2 is arch-shaped, type 3 is hook-shaped, and type 4 is uh, boat-shaped or inverted shape. We look at AC joint, we try to find out whether this is the cause of pain. So what you need to look for and what you need to report are large osteophytes, effusion, uh, capsular thickening more than 3 millimeters, chondral erosion and subchondral cystic changes. You can see that over here. You can see that the osteophytes, capsular thickening more than 3 mm, joint effusion, and here you can see chondral erosion, subchondral cystic changes on the actual FSPD images.